co-hosting duties, I was going to do it. Hi, and welcome, everybody. I'm Kathy Rowe, Executive Director of New Jersey Advocates for Aging Well. And this is the second in our technology webinar series, Technology and Aging, A Future of Independence. Today, we're going to talk about smart home technology. Um, I have been learning more and more about this, Mike, and I'm seriously going to go out and do some shopping after this presentation. Um, so I know nothing about this. So I'm going to turn it over to Mike Morata, the uh, director of the Richard West Assistive Technology Advocacy Center and his team, uh, Charlotte and Naomi. This is going to be recorded. If you'd like to go back and watch it later or share it with friends, we'll be sending you a link of the recording along with the slides that go with it. So Mike, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. I appreciate it. Welcome, everybody. It's good to see everybody. We're glad to be here um, with you today talking about smart home technology. And just like Kathy, I, there were things that I saw when we were putting this together that I'm like, I think I need to buy that as a business expense to make sure it was okay. Um, so hopefully we show some things that you are interested in as well as we go through. Uh, as we move through, if you'd like the slides, uh, the slides can be uh, accessed through that link that is on the screen. I'm pretty sure if we wait another second, Naomi will drop it in the chat for all of us. Um, you can also scan the QR code on the slide there as well. And it'll get you to all of the slides. And I, I think like anything else that Kathy mentioned, thank you, Naomi. Um, Kathy mentioned that the uh, recording will be available. I think having the slides is also helpful because some of the uh, items that we're gonna show and talk about, we've linked it into pictures. So the pictures, if you click them, will take you off to websites so you can uh, purchase them uh, and, or check them out and look further into them. So you might want those uh, slides as you go. So who are we? We're from the Richard West Assistive Technology Advocacy Center. I am Mike. I'm the director. With us today, we have Naomi. Naomi's running the chat, which she does such a great job with. Charlotte is on screen with me there. You see it. Charlotte is our intern for the summer. And so we are here to share information with you about this topic uh, and, and kind of have a conversation about it. I think, you know, like anything else in these webinars, we have a plan. I almost air quoted it out of, out of, um, habit, but I, we actually have a plan. We have things we could talk about, but I, I would uh, challenge anyone in the group with us today who's here with us live. If you have things that you'd like to talk about, throw it into the chat. Um, you know, we're in a meeting format. If you'd like to, if you'd like to turn on your camera and come on mic, we can do that too. Uh, we're game for anything. Uh, we're, we're perfectly comfortable with a detour and a uh, sidetrack. We'll eventually get ourselves back on track. We'll wrap ourselves up. We're, we're planning in our head for about an hour, give or take. Um, you know, as we as we move through this, so we'll see what our timing looks like as we go. Um, but we'll give kind of a, a broad spectrum of examples of smart home technology um, that can lead us to some conversation. So again, who are we? If you've never met us before, um, this is us. Uh, we are uh, the New Jersey Assistive Technology Act project. So every state in the country has an assistive technology act project that is federally funded to make sure that individuals in that state know about assistive technology, how to get it, um, and how to use it. So all of those things, we do a handful of services there, what I would call, I guess, our core services. Um, we do demonstrations of technology. We do this along with community partners. And so what we do is that if someone comes to us, an individual with a disability or uh, uh, someone who's working with an individual with a disability, family member, whoever it might be, just some connection to an individual with a disability. Um, and if you come to us with, a, with an issue, um, um, a struggle, a problem, uh, we can demonstrate and show you technology tools that might help you alleviate that problem. And we can um, show you how those work and show you the features of those tools and help you become better um, become more knowledgeable to make a better decision going forward about technology. Uh, we also host a loan program. Uh, we do that through Advancing Opportunities uh, as a community partner. And what they do is they host our lending center. And so we have devices in the lending center. If you would like to try them for several weeks at a time, that is a free service uh, for people in New Jersey. And basically you can go there uh, request the device, they will mail it to you with directions and labels to mail it back. So you will have a zero um, 
cost output of money for you in order to try that. Our whole hope there is the proverbial try before you buy. Um, get a chance to get your hands on stuff. Even thinking about the stuff we're going to talk about today, we'll look at tools today. They'll all look great, but they might not all need, meet your needs. And it, you might need to have that in your house to try it or your center or wherever the person's working to actually try it. So the lending program allows you to do that. And then finally, our, our third big service that we do is a device reuse program. Community partner for that is Goodwill Home Medical Equipment down in Belmar, the Camden County with a WR Belmar. Uh, and they have a large warehouse of uh, used medical equipment, durable medical equipment that they have taken in from the community, refurbished, clean, sterilized, gotten it back into working order, and they will turn around and resell it into the community for a significantly reduced rate. So if you're looking for some equipment, that might be a great place to start, see if they have something. So those are all of our uh, core services. Everything we talk about will be listed on our website, at4nj.org. Some of the other things, here's our upcoming webinars in this series. Uh, so if you're interested in joining us for uh, some of our other um, events, you can see they'll happen monthly. Uh, so in September, we're talking about telemedicine and monitoring. In October, we're going to do universal design and community access. Uh, in November, we're going to talk about um, AT supports for medication and management and, and uh, keeping yourself on track with that. And then finally, in December, uh, we're going to talk about activities for daily living. Uh, and so some of our lower tech aids that people might use uh, to remain more independent in the community. So that gives you a sense of what's coming up. Uh, we at our center are hosting our own series of webinars, uh, Tech Spotlights, where they're shorter, kind of half hour uh, webinars focused specifically on a specific tool or product. And you'll see there's a handful there all the way through um, into October. We have different uh, community um, providers of equipment and of service. So we're looking at things like the ABLE program is a service, um, but then the other ones are products as you go forward. And they're all listed again on our website. You can check them out and register for those. All of these webinars that we host through our center end up on our YouTube channel. So if you go to our YouTube channel, which is ATACNJ, um, you will be able to find those there. And then I think finally, no, I'm lying. I have two more slides, but uh, one of our other things we wanna share with you is we are in the midst of our planning for our live conference that happens in September. We're gonna do a two day conference focused on assistive technology and community living. Uh, so if you're interested in that, you can come join us for two days of concurrent session and learning alongside uh, individuals from across New Jersey about different areas of assistive tech. And then finally, before we start, we have, if you wanna learn more through this webinar format, maybe you do, maybe you enjoy this idea of kind of learning as you, uh, as you want, kind of an on-demand or just-in-time learning uh, through webinars. Uh, we have something that we have um, partnered with an organization called ATIA, which is the Assistive Tech Industry Association. And we have purchased a subscription for that program for everyone in the state of New Jersey to access their recorded webinar library. And so these are, these are recorded webinars that would usually cost about $40 or $50 uh, for you to watch. Uh, we have purchased the subscription for you. If you go through the link that's on the slide here or scan that code, it will take you to a form we will, where we ask you for some information. We have to confirm that you either live or work in New Jersey because of the fact we're using our federal funds to, to pay for this. Um, once you confirm that you live or work in New Jersey, we will send you a code, a coupon code. Then you can go to the Learning Center and add any webinar to your cart and use that code and your cost will be zero. Naomi just put the link in the chat so you have that as well. Um, I know the chat is going to be heavy with links now, but if you're following along, just click them and let those open in your browser. You could always go back to them later. And again, all of this listed on our website. You can always go back there and find this information. All right, that's all the stuff. That's all of the starting off stuff. Let's start talking about this idea of smart home technology um, and thinking about um, what that means for the people, for either ourselves or the people we work with. So here we'll start with the did you know, because I like those kind of things. Um, we're talking about smart home tools 
did you know that the first environmental control units, which were called ECUs, um, which were in essence smart home systems, those, when we think back to the late 80s, early 90s, those were systems that cost anywhere between ten and $15,000. So in order to get your house to respond to you in some alternate way by talking to it or hitting a switch or whatever it might be, $15,000 and some significant technology had to be infused into your, learn, your living environment in order for that to happen. Um, well, let's bust that myth right away as we go forward and we think about where we're at now with technology. Where are we at? We're at Amazon. We're at Google. And these devices cost anywhere from $29 to $200. Um, and then we add on little pieces. You might get a fully functional smart home system for maybe less than, I'm going to say maybe $300 or $400. Um, you might get a system that works for you and does all of those things you might need because it's, we've had this technology advancement. We've had this kind of commercialization of these supports. And any time our kind of specialized technology, we see this over and over again with assistive technology, assistive technology that's designed for individuals with disabilities, usually very expensive. As soon as that becomes mass marketed consumer electronics, what do we see? We see the price plummet and we see the availability rocket because it becomes embedded into all the tools that we have around us. Uh, for one of those $10,000 uh, environmental control units, you had to go to a specialized dealer. You probably had to have someone come to your house to install it. And it was probably a full day or two day event to get them to get it all set up. Now, I go onto Amazon. I order myself an Alexa. It comes to my house probably the same day at times. Um, and then I could have my house set up and ready to go um, with nothing more than just simply out of the box tools. Um, that is really powerful as we think about supports that we can use to keep people in the community living independently, providing them levels and layers of support. So as we go forward, I want to hear from you in the chat. So do you have one? How many of us here have uh, one of these voice assistants and what do you have? So let's, I'm just curious what people are using. Um, more than one, let us know. If you have more than one kind, let us know. Um, I'm, I'm one of those techie people that has more than one and I have two different kinds, Alexa's and I have Google Homes. So there we go. Althea says she has a Google Home. Jill says she has an Alexa Dot. Some as we start seeing, you know, what do people have available to them? Um, Alexa, Cindy's got an Alexa. Awesome. As we start thinking about some of the um, percentages of what these tools are out there, Kathy's got her Google Home. And we start to see the, the two that have been mentioned in the chat are the two primary ones uh, that people have. Um, so either it's the Echo products from Amazon or the Google products, which were the home. Now they're called the Nest products. That's kind of their um, umbrella term that Google has started using for all of their tools. Um, you see there are others and, and Apple has um, a, a, an assistant that goes in the house called HomePod. And Charlotte mentioned she has Siri on her phone. So HomePod, the, the Apple version runs Siri. That's what shows up on that one. So we see um, what tools are out there in the community and how people are using them. Ultimately, people will always ask, this is usually the first question people ask us as tech people, which one is best? Um, and of course, the answer is it depends. Um, there is no best. There's a best for me. There's a best for Charlotte. There's a best for everybody who's here. Um, and when we start thinking about that best and what one is most appropriate, we go back to looking at our process and we try to match people with technology, um, which is looking at something called the set framework, which talks about this idea of understanding who that person is. So what are their likes and dislikes, their abilities, the things they've tried in the past, the things that they want to do, um, then their environment, where are they using it? What is, what's happening in their environment. And especially when, we, especially when we think about this idea of smart home support, 
the environment piece becomes critical. Um, one of the things I always found interesting when we looked at those old $10,000 ECU systems, um, when you had to start ordering the parts, the first thing they did to you for you is ask you, what is it you're looking to do? And it was critical for that because the technology was in kind of its infancy there. So they really needed to have a good understanding. Um, and, and we've gotten a little away from that, but I would like to bring people back. Like, what is it you're trying to do? Uh, and so asking people, you know, what are you looking to control? A lot of times that's the first thing we'll talk about with people with smart homes is what do you want? What are you hoping to accomplish? Are you hoping to just talk to a device and get answers back? Then that's pretty much the out of the box Google Home and Siri and Alexa. Those are their out of the box features. Just talk to it and get answers back. Sometimes get answers, sometimes get answers that are not so great. Um, yesterday, and I'm thinking of mine because we were sitting in, in the kitchen talking and we were asking um, Alexa a question about the United States. It just turned on in my kitchen. I heard it turn on. Um, we, uh, we asked it a question about the United States, and it told us that the United States is located in Norton County. And I don't even know what that means. I, I like I can't even process that piece of information. Um, so sometimes not always great with the answers, but um, that was that was one example of not so that, something so good. So think about the environment you want to use these in, the tasks you want to complete. What is it you're hoping to accomplish? Is it just simply getting information from the internet? Is it controlling cameras? Is it security? Um, is it connecting with others outside your home? What is it? Those tasks and the environment. When I think about smart home stuff, these two kind of smash together for me um, because I think they're they're both intertwined, the environment and the tasks I want to accomplish. That will lead us to the tools. A great example of that when I think about the Alexa tools is the dot or even the the um, the airpod, the the home pod that's being shown in the picture here those devices don't have screens on them. So if you want a visual representation of something, that's not the right tool. Um, does it do most of the features you want? Yes. But if one of the things you want to do is be able to make video calls to, to a contact, um, you're not going to do that on a device like that. So that instantly becomes the wrong tool for you. And so getting the right tool means asking the right questions beforehand. Uh, and so thinking about how we do that becomes really important. Uh, what I like is and when I start thinking about some of these um, kind of pieces of information we're finding out and, and we're, we're seeing more and more um, our community as, as individuals start to age up and are starting to look for ways to stay in their homes longer and be independent longer, um, we have a lot of interest in this all of a sudden. This is an area of interest. 51% of homeowners, 50 or older, already have this or are interested in getting it. Uh, and so that's really interesting because that means that this area of technology has reached a bit of a saturation point where people are familiar with it and they're looking to see how they can use this in their own homes to be successful. Um, Thinking about what people are willing to spend on this also becomes really interesting because then you see people are willing to spend some money on this. But I think I, I think looking at what people are willing to spend compared to what they might need uh, becomes really important. And it starts to be an idea of prioritizing uh, supports. And you could go all in on some of these tools and they would be a very expensive thing in the beginning here. Um, but maybe you ease into some of those things. And so what are we looking at when we think about this idea? Oops, sorry. Too fast. Um, think about benefits of why this smart home technology might help, which is safety and security. Maybe there is an energy feature to this of saving energy or cost effectiveness, especially with those thermostats that can be controlled um, through your smart home technology to come on and off whenever. Um, and thinking about the elimination of difficult tasks or the or the making those tasks easier for people so they can complete them on their own. Uh, our friends at the United Way up in uh, North Jersey um, give us this list. They do a really great program um, looking at smart technology in the community. Um, and, and this is a, a list they came up with, which really 
starts to give us an idea of how this might be helpful um, in thinking about caregiving tasks and streamlining that, thinking about um, a return to work, a reduction of stress, any of these things that we think about um, that we can use some of these technology tools to help us with. The big one that we always point towards um, is reduced social isolation. How do we make sure that we increase an individual's ability to connect to the larger community? And these technology tools will give us that opportunity now to allow individuals to not feel isolated. You know, it's kind of interesting. This started in um, during COVID where our federal funds actually were shifted a little, and that became a really big push of the federal funds that we're supposed to spend using, looking at AT in our, in our communities here. And one of that, the big changes was reducing social isolation. That has been a big one for us. Some of the benefits of these technology tools um, for long distance. So this is the idea of me providing to support to someone remotely, someone who lives somewhere else from me, but I can pop in. So if that visual component is there of their device, I can pop in on a screen. I can get notifications if something is happening. I might be able to remotely turn things on and off for people. Um, everything from lights to a door to appliances, whatever it might be. Um, I can monitor security-wise who's coming and going from some distant location from myself. And those in themselves will become really critical of how we can make sure um, we can provide support to that individual. Um, with any technology, there's always a few disadvantages, and I think these are fair to bring out um, because we need to be aware of that and think about how do we overcome them or put, si or put some services in place for that individual to make sure that this doesn't happen. Ultimately, a lot of these tools will need some kind of Wi-Fi. So internet access becomes important for some of these features in order for them to work. Uh, the lack of support for, and, and you'll know we're tech people when we write slides and we say lack of support when things go wrong, not if, we've chosen to go with when, because we know they will, but what happens when something goes wrong? Uh, one of my, my, favorite examples of this story uh, of, of a simple solution that we didn't think through well before we started was providing an individual, um, this was me at a previous job, providing an individual um, a smartphone for their for, to be more independent um, and not reminding them that their smartphone and their tablet use the same power cord. And so the something that went wrong was the person ran over the power cord for their tablet with their wheelchair and broke it and then stopped using their tablet. And when I went next time, I said, well, why aren't you using your tablet? And they said, well, but my tablet's dead and I don't have a cord anymore to charge it. And then reminding them, oh, it's the same cord that you have for your phone. That was kind of why we got both of the same, but then we never really did a good job of explaining that to the person. So that was the, um, a lack of support on our case of getting them prepared for when something happened. You know, thinking about when technology changes, how do we make sure they're comfortable with that? When it asks for an up update, does that cause some concern for the person? Does that cause them to have panic um, that it's asking them to update their tools? Um, if their Wi-Fi goes out, how do they make sure they get it reconnected? Um, the idea of privacy. One of the biggest things about these voice assistants is they are listening to you. I told you I was talking in here in my device all the way in the other room popped on and it started talking. I don't know what it said, but it was saying something. So it's always listening. And, and some people would be concerned about that as a privacy issue. Uh, and I think you have to be um, upfront about that and decide where that fits on your comfort level personally um, of what you say around it, what you do around it. How do you go forward? All of these devices have an ability to turn their microphone off, like flat out off. So it can't do anything. It's not listening at all. So thinking about that as you go forward. So let's talk about some of the voice assistants. Let's dig through some of them. Then we'll look at some of the smart home things that we can talk about. Uh, and as we think about these ideas of the tools that are out there in our community, um, you know, what do you do? 
And here's another one I'll ask you in the chat. What's your, everybody who answered before that you had one, what is your go-to thing you do with your voice assistant? What do you use it for? Play music. Colleen, I'm with you. It's constant. That's how music is playing in my house all the time, playing through it. Yes, I agree. What else do people do with theirs? Ask you questions, of course. Naomi, excellent. Music and recipes. Yeah, those are great. Those kind of quick interactions. Oh, here we come. Here we go. Okay. Allison uses Google Voice Assist on my phone. I use it mostly turn timer, oh, set timers and turn the lights on and off. Awesome. Nancy turning her lights on and off too. Awesome. This idea of what are people doing with their products? Here's what they find. Um, yeah, Kathy, check your weather. Um, all the reminders and making lists. Here's what people are doing with these devices. And so when we start thinking about um, what are the most used um, features of this device, that's what I would call these is your most used features. Um, playing music, asking questions, checking the weather, setting a timer, setting an alarm, listening to the radio, listening to news. That everything above 50. 50% of people using it. That, that's where I, I jumped in. And so that's where I start to look at, okay, those are the things most people are doing with it. What are some of the other things that we start seeing that could be more beneficial to individuals we're working with? And it's some of the things that we mentioned in the chat. Um, finding a recipe, instructions for cooking, calling something, calling someone, sending a message. So connecting with others, making a video call, those kinds of things, um, you know, using it as a smart home tool, those kind of things become really important that we give people the understanding of how to do those and what these things look like um, as they're running. And so here's some of these unique kind of experiences we can do with these. Sorry, I'm trying to slide my um, our pictures out of the way so I can turn on the video. Uh, so we have that idea, and someone mentioned in the chat, using it to turn lights on and off. Um, I want to play just a part of this video, um, but now I have to reshare because I don't think I shared with sound. Hold on. Oh, I did. I just wanted to make sure. Um, I wanted to be able to hear it. If you've seen, this actually was on one of the Amazon Alexa commercials they had. So this idea of the power of simply using a voice tool control an environment. This is Alexa. I decided to set up Alexa in his home as well. And recently I had an idea to sneak into Kenny's apartment and take off his light bulbs that he has and connect some smart bulbs for Alexa because Kenny has terrible light switches in his home. This light does this one and this switch does that. And then you have to go clear across the apartment. How many of us have that experience, by the way? I'll, I'll put the video back on. But switches that don't, two different switches control the same lighting. You never know which one is on. Um, that, that just really, that struck me. And to flip another switch and they're really confusing. What if I had another idea? Yeah. To fix all your problems with these lights. What if I could say like, Alexa, turn off the lights. Yes. Okay. Or what if I could say like, Alexa, turn on the lights. Okay. When Alexa did that for me, I almost fell over and hit the floor. I don't believe this. I got down and I almost passed out. I couldn't believe this technology. Alexa, would you please turn the lights off? Okay. Alexa, thank you so much. You are so very welcome. What can I say? I mean, I love it. I really do. I love that. Alexa. I, I like the idea of that, 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 that simplicity of that tool, but instantly magnifying its usefulness for someone. And so you can do that through voice enabled bulbs. You can have plugs that plug into the wall that allow you to plug in lamps to it, whatever it might be. Lots of different options um, to do that. So you see some of the examples up on the slide there. Um, of different names of these lights and the and the um, plugs that will allow you to do that. Um, but thinking about what my Alexa is just talking away in my kitchen right now because I keep saying it and it's really dialed into me right now. Um, but thinking about what it's Alexa, we can run, I decided um, and how we do that. Um, are we automating other things in our house? 
um, in an individual's environment. So we're using smart plugs that then will connect to other things. Um, are we using voice enabled appliances? The two appliances on the right are voice enabled, a coffee pot and a microwave, which are voice enabled and you can just talk to them directly. Um, now I'm gonna I'm gonna put a warning on all of this because I think it's something we have to have that conversation about is what are you plugging into these things? What are you running? And what kinds of safety features do they have to make sure they don't run unattended and cause a problem? That is always my big fear with these kinds of things. And it's something um, we have to concern ourselves with and think about. Althea mentions that she has a, a, a coffee pot on a smart switch. Awesome. I think that's great. I think that's really cool. Like anything else, I, I, I'm hesitant to plug some things in. So think about what you're plugging into these. And I go with the, with the old strategy of if this device was left on and I didn't know it, would it burn my house down? And that's usually my starting point. Uh, I've seen, unfortunately, people plug in space heaters to some of these and then there's left on and they don't know it. That is officially into my not good category. It's not good. You can't do that. So think about what you're plugging into this. What are some of the safety features built into it um, so that these things aren't left on um, and cause some problems? So we have all bunches of smart plugs that you can use, which are relatively inexpensive now. They're probably about 10 or 15 bucks, um, and you can have a smart plug to plug anything into it. You know, your thermostats that will connect through your voice assistant uh, and allow you to manage your environment and keep that environment running. Security cameras, there's tons of these out there. Can you pair these with some of your voice assistants to make a really well-designed security system? And, and so I, I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not a shill for Amazon, but it just happens to be this is what a lot of the tools are from, and they work very seamlessly with the Alexas. Um, you, know, you, can, you can use... Um, the any of the the ring cameras or any of these other lights, any of those are cameras and all those things, these will all work. On the screen right now, I have the Blink. The mini Blink is owned by Amazon. It works with Alexa seamlessly. Um, and so maybe those are the things you start to look at for someone. Is there an opportunity for, for me to put in security cameras, a video doorbell, that then that picture will go to the Amazon Alexa screen. So in our house, we have a video doorbell that then that video shows to the Alexa show that is in our kitchen. And then we can ask it to pull up any of the other cameras too that are in the house or outside the house. Uh, and so it's all tied together into this one hub, the hub being the Amazon Alexa and all these other pieces are attached to it. Uh, and so thinking about that, relatively inexpensive. I think that camera on the left is like $30. Um, and so, you know, it's not, doesn't cost nothing, but in the bigger scheme of things, you're talking about a little expense to get a lot of support for an individual, especially if we have someone who's living on their own and we want to be able to monitor comings and goings, who's knocking on the door, those kinds of things, that might be a way to do some of that. So again, thinking about how we can start to pair some of these tools together to make a really well thought out system for people. And maybe it's things like, and I would call these security, um, motorized blinds that will connect into your voice assistant that you can control them simply with your voice. Uh, and so either there is, so there's two different versions on this um, slide. Oh, look, Kathy, you're much more smart homie than you give yourself credit for. Uh, Awesome. So Kathy said she, she just sold the Blink cameras in her in-law's house to monitor how they're doing. It's awesome. That's perfect. Um, and easy to do and simple with the notifications. And that's really a, a great way to do that. Thinking about these blinds, you have a couple of ways that they can do this. If you look on the left, that is a, a motorized blind control that is um, hardwired in and plugged in directly to the blinds. And that's how it runs. The one on the right is called the switch bot, which is a device that hangs on the curtain rod, the curtain rod. And as you hit the button, 
it crawls across the curtain rod, bringing the curtains with it back and forth. So I would call that one a little lower tech than the other one. Um, I think the switch bot, you're talking about something that's a little less expensive too, by the way. Uh -oh. I, I knew someone, Jill, I knew someone was going to ask that. And I was about to say out loud, I have no idea how much that costs, but wait, the link is on the picture. It costs $84 and 15 cents. Um, and so that is a pretty good deal. Get it today if you're a prime member for 16% off. And you can have it shipped to your house. So that's a good question, Jill. Thank you. And the SwitchBot has a couple other tools that they have. They have the curtain one. They have another one, which we didn't put the picture in, but it's one of my personal favorites. Yeah, we didn't put the picture in. We took it out. Um, it's an actual box that you can tape to an item. Think about a switch on the wall that is a physical switch that you need to manipulate. So the switch bot has a little arm that sticks out of it. And when you send a command to it, there's a little arm that raises or lowers to turn those things on and off. So if you have something that physically is a switch you have to hit, uh, you can hit that. You could stick it to your printer on the power button and you could hit it and it would swing down and hit the power button to turn it on. Then when you're done, hit it again, it'll swing down to turn the power button off. So different kinds of uses for the switch bot. But the idea is that it's allowing you to do physical motions remotely. In this case, the curtains in the regular switch bot, it would be switches or some other type of item that has to be physically uh, manipulated. Other things we think about for security um, is maybe voice enabled door locks. The one on the left is a voice enabled door lock that you speak to it or speak through your voice assistant and it sends the signal to the voice the, to that lock, that knob and opens the door. So you've removed the knob or the lever and then this thing is replaced it. That thing's $23. What are we what are we saying is $23? Oh, the, the switch bot's $23. Uh, Naomi put the other example of the switch bot in there. Naomi, I was like, there's no way this thing's $23. But it is $89. And so what it is is it re it replaces the knob with this cylinder, and the cylinder actually works and manipulates the knob and opens it through a command through an app or through your smart home device. Uh, and so suddenly um, you have this ability to retrofit a doorknob for less than $100 um, to be voice enabled for some security. There are other, other items too. The, the item on the right is a, a more intense version of a secured lock. This one's going to be a couple hundred dollars, $170. Um, so this one would be a little bit more this fingerprint enabled it's a uh, touch screen it's got this whole it connects into other things so that's another um, example of one that's a little bit more involved um, but depending on what you're talking about i think the nice thing about this area of technology that we're seeing is that this in my mind is like an exploding area of technology right now so these items are becoming more available and they are becoming less expensive. This would have been an area probably a couple of years back where a voice enabled smart lock for your door probably would not have been cost effective for most people. Probably talking like a thousand dollars a few years ago. So we're seeing how these are coming down because there's more of them out there um, and that people are buying more of them. So it's bringing the price down. Um, are you looking for things to make sure that there are no emergency situations in the, in the home? So this is called the iGuard stove. You mount this into your house and it detects that the stove has been left on. Um, so you think about these kind of items. Th there's a video for it on the bottom too. So you could watch the videos when you go through the, um, the slides. Um, but these kinds of things, this goes back to, if we think about when I mentioned in the beginning, that set framework idea to this, what does the person need to do? And we start making that list. And it might be a question of, we might not have thought of everything until we do a little walk through a house. Like we're walking through and we're like, oh, well, then the microwave and the stove, but what if the stove is left on? That could be a, a situation that would be 
um, obviously a concern for safety. I'll save the video for now. Um, maybe there's one of these. These are also areas that are becoming very popular. These ovens, this one, this is just called the June oven. That's its name. But these ovens that are controlled, they're smart ovens. And so I put things in there. I tell it through an app what it is I'm cooking. It automatically sets the time and temperature and it cooks it. There is no way for me to leave this on too long. It will shut itself off automatically. Even if I override it and ask it to cook more, it will turn itself off when it detects that, that something is cooked too much or it's been on too long. And so these are really cool. These are still a little expensive. This oven I think is about 600 or $700. So these might not be something that we look at right away, but it might be an option. And if there is a situation where we want to find an opportunity to get someone to live independently in the community and our only fear that they might leave the oven on, maybe the, the uh, apartment or home becomes equipped with something like this um, and one of these items instead. And then we don't have that worry anymore. And the person can be independent and I can run it through an app or I can punch the code into the little um, screen that's on the front there, and that'll work. So check that out, the June oven. So the, the link on the right was the, you know, the guy tried it for a while, and he's going to give you his feedback on how it went. Um, and so these are, these are interesting items so, so you might need to start thinking about. Um, we look at providing a full smart home or connected home environment for someone to live in. There's some other things. This is like just the basic list of other things to think about. Motion activated lights. So, you know, on stairs, as I'm going down the stairs or going up the stairs at night, the lights are coming on and they're turning off when I'm done. I don't have to worry about hitting a switch or doing anything else. These are from Amazon. No, I think click the link. The link's in the picture. Walmart. This was Walmart. And these things were only $16 a piece. And they're LED lights. So you just put a battery in there and run them, mount them however you want, stick them to the wall. Um, and suddenly I have motion activated lights wherever I might need them. Same thing thinking about faucets or any of those other things. If you've seen any of those new faucets now, uh, faucets that have automatic um, temperature control, so it won't go any higher. Even if I'm turning the knobs, it won't go higher than anything. I can set those things, um, but also I can choose how the, the temperature of the water comes out. Um, thinking about any kind of motion sensors, anything like that. I mean, I, we're, we're throwing you the big giant list of things to think about. Is everything going to be necessary for everybody's home? No, probably not. But it's important to ask the questions because what we want to do is make sure that the system we put in place, I, and, and personally, I think this is one of the harder things now. I think cost has come really far down on a lot of these items, which is great. That also means that sometimes we have these disconnected systems of ideas in people's houses. Like I got a light over here that works and I got a faucet over here that works and I got an Alexa over here that works and I got a lot of pieces, but I don't know if I have a system. And that's where the planning comes in to start thinking about what is it we're trying to accomplish with this? And are we doing that? And are we making it simple for this person to manage it themselves and perform all the tasks they want to? camera over here that's working. That's great. But is it tied to this other piece? No. Well, then let's make sure that it does. Let's make sure those things are pulled together into the same system. So they're working really well. And we have other things we can do. This is something from alarm.com where you can set up a monitoring system. A lot of these ones that we've talked about already in our kind of smart home idea um, have been passive monitoring. This would be a more active monitoring. This is something where you have someone keeping an eye, 
keeping it, not keeping it, but you know, there are, there are ways that someone is always connected to this to make sure when alerts happen or when, interestingly, when I think about what these systems can provide for peace of mind and for independence, one of the things that this one um, sends alerts, it sends alerts if there is unusual movement or no movement. So if things have been quiet for a while, it also sends an alert. And I think that could be beneficial for individuals as well. Um, you know, they, they, I, I like the alerts that this system sends alert if the fridge hasn't been opened in a while. Like it's checking to kind of see timing wise, this is something that should have happened fairly regularly and it hasn't. Maybe there's something happening. Those are interesting uh, things to look at. So that is the alarm.com. But again, that is an active monitoring. That will be monthly subscriptions along with the equipment that goes with it. Um, so again, it's all about layers of what is it we're trying to do and how much do we want to spend and what does our system look like? And then we mentioned it in the beginning, but there's always these thoughts about what happens when it breaks? What do we do? How do we find the support to have someone move forward? Um, think about this idea. You know, we start with our list of suggestions here um, is go to YouTube. If this device has been out there, you can be sure it is broken before and someone's probably put a video up of how they fix it. If it's Amazon Alexa products, there is a support number. Someone is there, is there, um, and you can get someone on the phone to get some help. Um, you can look at any of these in Coles. They have the smart home experience. So some of them you'll be able to go there and explore. Um, don't discount the idea of friends and families and caregivers as supports. Uh, I, I always laugh kind of half jokingly that anytime a person's items disconnect from a Wi-Fi, all they need to find is an eight-year-old in their family. They can probably help them connect it back up with the Wi-Fi. So if the Wi-Fi is the issue, people should know how to do those kinds of things. A friend or family, a neighbor, whoever it might be. Um, are there independent consultants that are out there? Is there something that we can help um, as we go forward? We are, we are community providers of support uh, that might be able to help people move in the right direction with some of these things. So thinking about how they go forward and thinking about these things before something breaks, not after it breaks. Once it's broken, the panic has set in, things have gone horribly wrong, everybody's worried, they can't move forward. Um, so we need to think about this before things break. And then we also just gave you a bunch of resources. Um, you know, we're, we're big fans of just more information that you might need right now, but at least you have it. Um, other things about how you can get help on Google devices, on, on Alexa devices. Um, there's some good articles there um, that talk about um, using Alexa to age in place, um, smart home devices that are, are around for 2023. The, the top link there talks about creating Alexa routines. And if, if we didn't go into that now um, in this webinar, but one of the ways that you can extend the functionality of your devices is to use things that they call routines or skills. Skills would be little apps that you could install into your smart devices to connect them to something else. I have an Alexa skill that connects my Alexa to my Sirius XM account so I can play music there. That's a skill. So think of that skill as a bridge in between two things that might not work together. Uh, routines will allow you to create processes that your device could accomplish. Like, Alexa, it's time to go to bed. And by saying that, you would launch a routine that might shut your lights off, arm your security cameras, and then do one other thing. So it might launch a couple things in a row. That would be a routine. So routines are stringing actions together. Skills allow you to perform ta a task with devices that don't normally work together. There's some resources for you. I think... That is our last slide. So I would say to everyone here, thoughts, questions, comments. Uh, what do you do with your device? What would you like to share? I'm going to turn off my screen share so I can see everybody. In the, in the um, I wanted to let you know, Mike, when you said that, mine started talking in the background. I realized I should have warned all of you that as I kept saying that it was launching everybody's and I apologize for that. Well, then I told it to stop and then I just muted mine. 
I, I saw you get up and I was like, okay, yeah, that, that's funny that you got up to me. I just ignored mine. Mine's been talking in my kitchen for a while. Well, no, mine said thunderstorm sounds, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, it's, oh, mine's doing something too. But, uh, so what else do people have questions about? What other areas of this um, could be helpful that we maybe didn't touch on? What do you think, Kathy? You got an idea? I think there were so many great things. And I know, um, like I said, we, at our, my in-laws home, we put in blink cameras because they had a few concerns about safety, but also um, one of them has a form of dementia and is putting things in strange places. So instead of just putting it outside for safety, we put it inside. So then we could see where did they put the checkbook or something and it cut down on stress and looking for things. But also um, for my side of the family and my mother, she's very resistant to technology. Mm -hmm. So how can we talk to people to show them the benefits of this so that they don't feel dumb? I, I think we, yeah. you know, we all hear when you say, oh, I have some of you people, you know, they, they don't want to feel dumb. They don't want to feel like they're outdated. So they're not getting the benefit of it. Like, how can we start those conversations and be productive? Yeah. I, I think that it's always interesting, Kathy. I, I, I'm going to go back to that video I showed you of, of Kenny and his lights. Yeah. It was a hook of something that was important to him. Okay. I would have to imagine that the, that lady who was working with him, and they've done a bunch of videos, which are really interesting of him doing different things. I'm going to guess that that rolled out over time. Okay. And it was like, hey, how about we try this? Because this... Is been has been identified by you as an issue. Okay. So, you know, what did the person identify as something? And, and you know, I think, and, and I could be just as guilty of this as anybody else. I love all the things technology does, right, but right. I recognize not everybody does. And, right. and I'll go the same way with you, Kat, I, I, with my mother in law. Um, we had an old Google Home that was just sitting in our house. She happened to come to our house one day and she said, you know what I wish I had? And when someone says that now, right away, I'm really dialed in. I'm like, oh, wait a second. So, you know what I wish I had? Wish I had a way to just have music play in my house mm -hmm. um, throughout um, without having to search different radio stations. So that she had already a pretty really defined okay. way she wanted to interact with technology. And that gave me the opening. And it's funny. I, I remember to this day, my wife, like having that moment, like she knew she just waited because she knew I was about to go and launch into something. And I said to her, I said, mom, what if we could set this up in two rooms of your house and connect it together? Mm -hmm. And all you'd have to do was ask it to play whoever you wanted to listen to at the okay. time. And, and her first thought was, well, that can't work. And I was like, no, I think it can work. And we have it here. And of course, we had that device sitting in our home. That right, we were right. Using. And so we brought it over and we hooked it up for her. And, and that was the hook. That was the way. So it has to be what people, time. what people, what individual wants, not what you want for yeah. them or think right. they should have, but exactly. what do they want and need. And, 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 and even at that point, yeah, yeah. we put that in her house. And she said, does it do more? And I'm like, oh. sure, it does more. Do you want it to do more? And, and so I waited for her to decide she wanted to use more. And for a long time, she didn't set that thing to do anything else except the music. Okay. But now it's set and she has, she has, um, she asks it for recipes. She runs a timer off of it. She's doing a lot of those features of it, which I think have been really helpful, uh -huh. but that's come over time. It really was. If you asked her what that thing does in her house, it plays music. That's its answer. Yeah, yeah. It does these other things, but it plays music. And she learned it at her pace. Yeah, yeah. And then eventually work towards it. Um, and I think that's a really good way um, to find things. You know, ask people, what's the one thing you would like to do? Mm -hmm. What's the yeah. most important thing? Because again, they do so many things. We could easily, I mean, think I could actually make your head hurt with the amount of ideas I could give you for one of these things, but that's not going to help anybody. Right. Right. Um, you know, maybe with the Alexa shows, maybe it's nothing more than showing people how they can connect remotely to a family member through video and have a conversation. Oh, wow. Perfect. Great. You both have one in your, in your contacts and just say, 
call so-and-so and they show up on the screen and you're just talking to it like we are right now. That's awesome. Yeah. That's a good yeah. solution. So like I said, I'm going to go shopping now and buy a few of these. But before we go, does anybody else have questions? Hey, Jill. Um, yeah, Mike, I, I work a lot with persons with dementia. And I guess there always comes the ethics of cameras and, you know, how a family could really monitor somebody. But, you know, is that person really aware? Um, is this infringing on any kind of privacy rights. So that always gets a little sticky in my world as a care manager. I think you're right, Jill. And I think those are, and, and you know, and even Kathy mentioned that in her conversation. And I think these are the conversations that are more important. With that being said, the technology's there. We can figure that part out. I'm less worried about that. I'm more worried about the, what is the system look like and are people comfortable with that? And everybody's going to have different levels of comfort with that, by the way. And so I think for us as service providers, I think it's really important to take that little half step backwards. You know, Jill, and I think you even did it in your description just now, Jill. You took a half step backwards. Like, look, what do you think? I know what this stuff can do, but where are you all at? Um, because I agree. I think that you could see the power of this but I could also instantly switch this and say, this is incredibly intrusive. I could have that conversation, just flipping a coin and have it right now. And so I get that. And I think that has to become a conversation with the people yeah, that are in that I've environment. Told families is, you know, be careful about where you're putting stuff. Like, yeah. you know, I know you want to check that mom gets out of bed, but you know, it's like some places are more private than others. It's like, yeah. uh, you know. Yeah. yeah. And, and you're right. And, and Jill, in that same idea, is it a bedroom thing or is it a hallway pointing down the hallway where I see the bedroom door open? Okay. Now I have that kind of, right. I agree. I think, yeah, I, I have had conversations with people where they were, they were wondering how we could mount a camera in a bathroom. And I had a lot of conversation with that person. And I was like, look, that is not, and I just flat out said, I go, that's not cool. I don't think we should do that. I, I really am not comfortable with that. I'm not comfortable with that. And have you even asked the person yet? And what happened is the person had not asked the actual consumer. And the consumer's like, I would no, I'm not going to put that in my bathroom. So I think those are, and it goes back to your comment, Jill. It's the thought was, was good. I got the thought. Make sure they don't fall getting out of the tub. Yeah, that's important but your mode of getting there was a little uncomfortable. That's maybe well, so not the what best. What are the laws? Like I have some that want to watch the caregiver, the agency. What are the laws on notifying that company or that individual that they're being recorded and they're being watched, right? Yeah, I agree. I think that, and, and I also don't know what the laws were. And I would think just personally um, as a, as kind of a best practice, if you're being recorded, I'm going to tell you this is happening. I also, I have to tell you as a provider now, I go into people's houses assuming I'm being recorded. I, that's just me personally, as I go in and out of environments, I'm going with the assumption there is a camera there somewhere. I'm not actively looking for it, yet I am actively looking for it as I come in there. Um, and so I think that has to, you know, as a service provider, a caregiver, um, I think we have some ways we can we can um, ensure that we are protecting ourselves also. So, and that's what I mean, Jill. I think we could talk about this for an hour and never mention a piece of technology, right? I think it's these bigger conversations that has to happen. The the tech is cool. Sometimes I think the tech opens the door to a conversation like this where we might not have had it otherwise, which could be equally as helpful. And, yeah. and I wonder if. Like legally, I remember several years ago, there's a lot of talk about nanny camps for yeah. child care. And when you think of it, it would be the same people that 10 years ago had it for their children who are now concerned about having it for their parents. And I wonder, I don't know, but it might yeah. be the same um, rules or laws or whatever, because it is basically the same thing. I would like to think it's basically the same. Yeah, I think the tech is different. And maybe ultimately what you're using it for might be a little different, but the idea is the same. Yeah. 
it's that mo video monitoring and whether yeah. people know or not. Yeah. I, I've also told people quite honestly, you know, if you're going to put a camera in your house, put it somewhere kind of obvious. So people see it and there's a visual cue that this is happening right now. Mm. You know, I think a lot of times people are trying to tuck these into corners so they don't get seen. Or they're trying to put them somewhere hidden, which is fine. I get it. Um, but I think there is that visual cue of, oh, this is happening right now in this space. Ah, such a good conversation. We could have this all day long. I think it's great. Um, well, Jill, we thank you for an, bringing it up. Yeah, thank you. So we are at an hour. Um, we are going to send all of you and everybody who registered a link to this along with the slides, and we will be posting it on our website. We hope that we see you next month on September 13th. At noon, we're going to be talking about telemedicine and older adults. Um, you, If you haven't registered for that already, you can go back to the same link and register again. But uh, we really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you, Mike and team. Once again, I always learn something new. And hopefully yeah. we'll see you next month. Thanks. Take care, everybody. Have a great Bye. day.